Okay. Okay. So um, it's my honor and truthfully a dream come true to introduce Rita Caldwell as our pioneer um, seminar speaker at the Institute for Genomic Biology today. It is somewhat of an understatement to say that uh, Dr. Caldwell is an internationally recognized leader in science and the list of her honors, if I tried to, and appointments, if I tried to um, do them all would go on for the entire hour. So I'm just gonna um, mention um, some of the ones that um, are the most well-known. Um, so not the least of which is her, um, her appointment as president of ASM of the AAAS and as director of the NSF for, for six years. Um, in her position at the NSF, she was the first woman, one of the first biologists and a microbiologist. And I think all of that um, kind of characterizes her, her approach to the, um, what she's done with her career, which is always looking out. Um, for those that are typically hidden from you, like the microbes, but really are making the world go round. Um, we are really lucky that she has recently published a book describing her career um, and you should um, read it. It's a, it's a really nice read. I um, got it and read it over the weekend and really, really enjoyed it. Um, like she said, it's all out there now for everybody to see. So um, she didn't hold back on any of her, of her thoughts and it's really, it's really great. Um, and because of that, we can really focus for the rest of the day today on the reason the um, Infection for Genomics for One Health IGO theme nominated Dr. Caldwell years ago to come for this, um, for a talk at the IGB is because of her science. So uh, like I said, Dr. Caldwell is a microbiologist. She has over a thousand publications, um, most of which focus on Vibrio cholera and like Abigail Salyers, I think her work is really um, at the um, nexus between um, medical microbiology and microbial ecology, something that she's used as a, as a theme throughout her research to kind of bring those two fields together. Um, her work on cholera includes publications that classical microbiologists would feel comfortable with, like host-microbe interactions, pathogenicity, genetics, molecular biology, um, microbial ecology um, uh, work, looking at diversity, and even exposing the importance of the viable non-culturable microbes that are out there, um, that even for something like Vibrio cholera, which has well-established lab protocols, if you catch them at the wrong time, they might not be able to grow in the lab, and so we're missing most of the world out there by focusing only on culture. Um, but she also has a significant work in other fields outside of the field of microbiology, integrating climate science and modeling and biocultural approaches to infectious disease. So all of that together um, represents the shining example, I think, of what our theme IGO is setting out to do, to, uni to unify the concepts of infection biology across the siloed fields of, of medicine and engineering and basic biology. And so we couldn't be more thrilled to have her here, um, if only virtually, um, to, to give her a talk today, Climate, Oceans, and Health, Human Health, What Cholera Can Teach Us About COVID-19. Well, thank you very much, Rachel, uh, for a very kind introduction. Um, I hope that uh, you all can, can hear. I, I too wish that I could be there because uh, I have a lot of sentimental connections with the uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Uh, my, my daughter did a MD, PhD at uh, Champaign-Urbana and uh, I have many colleagues there. What I'd like to talk about today is the interaction of climate, oceans, and human health, uh, describing the work on cholera, but also using it as a um, jumping point to the current work that's underway on the COVID-19 virus. So if I could move on the slides pretty quickly, let me go to the next slide. Vicki is going to, my assistant is going to be very kind and help by, by um, moving from slide to slide. So I'm going to focus on water-borne disease in the discussion of cholera and, and point out particularly that 
um, it remains a pandemic um, and it is global. Um, it, it also is uh, dramatic in the numbers of individuals affected by diarrheal disease in general. It's uh, one and a half billion cases every year and a couple of million deaths, um, mainly from cholera. So the next slide will give a, a picture of cholera. It's a global disease and let's go through the steps quickly. It's acute water-related diarrheal disease. Um, it occurs in what we call pandemics. The first was uh, described in 1960, or the seventh, I'm sorry, the seventh began in 1960 and it continues to the present time. And it's affecting about 50 countries and about 7 million people. Now, unfairly, we've referred to the ben Bengal Delta as the home, but really until 1920, uh, when we began uh, chlorinating um, water in the, in the United States, we had cholera um, seasonally in the summer months in uh, Washington, D.C. and in um, New York City. Uh, in fact, in Washington, uh, it was a miasmic swamp until the 1920s, we had yellow fever and cholera. Um, and um, at the time it was built on a swamp and so considered a miasmic swamp. Today we call it a miasmic swamp, but I guess for different reasons. Next slide, please. Um, so what's interesting is that new biotypes are emerging and I don't think we can really eradicate the disease because we did make the discovery back in, I guess about 1975, that this bacterium is located in the natural environment. And shown here is the work done in, from 1970 to the present. Uh, it continues today, studying the distribution of Vibrios in the Chesapeake Bay and the numbers of the stations that are sampled on a regular basis. Um, but we did discover that there's a specific salinity, mid-bay near about where Ken Island is located, um, is a salinity of about 15 parts per thousand, which is optimum for Vibrio cholerae. And lower in the bay, Vibrio parahemolyticus, another pathogenic species, and Vibrio vulnificus, usually in the tidal estuaries of the Choptank River. Next slide. The discovery we made very early on was um, that this bacterium is associated with plankton. And the microorganism, which you can see in the slide, is a curved rod with a polyflagellum. And it is associated with copepods. Um, copepods have a chitin and acetyl glucosamine structure, um, polymer. And the enzyme, the chitinase, is present um, on the bacterium. Shown here is a gravid female about to release eggs into the water column. And um, the egg sac breaks and, and the Vibrio cholerae coats the surface of the egg sac. It has a powerful, uh, chit uh, powerful proteolytic enzyme. And we suspect that there's an evolutionary uh, symbiosis of some sort here with the sac actually being broken by the enzymes of the coated uh, Vibrio cells and the eggs are then released into the water column. And the bacterium uh, is particularly found along the axillae, the, the appendages, and uh, in the um, uh, internal gut of the organism, of the, of the uh, plankton. The next slide. And so the very early work back in the 70s, uh, we developed this model for the transmission of Vibrio cholerae. I must say that uh, it was not well received. The medical community really did not believe, and some still don't believe, uh, doubting Thomas's, that the bacterium is naturally occurring in the environment, but there are several hundred papers now from other investigators that make it quite clear that you can isolate Vibrio cholerae from estuaries and river systems. But the relationship of, of the plankton is important because um, without treated water, filtered and uh, chlorinated, um, you will pick up sufficient numbers of Vibrio cholerae. Um, it takes about a million cells to really uh, initiate a, a rabid case, a, a real case of cholera. If you, in, if you ingest a few hundred cells or maybe 10 or 20, you might have a single case of diarrhea. You might be nauseated for a day or so, but you won't have necessarily the full-blown Vibrio cholerae. So this work was shown by a, a team um, um, working at the uh, uh, Cholera Institute in, in Bangladesh 
and also at Johns Hopkins and at the um, Harvard School of Public Health, uh, showed that it takes about a million cells as a, as a dose. So it's a dose dependent, numbers of cells dose dependent for the disease. May I have the next slide then? So um, I was asked early in my work to go to Bangladesh and determine whether in fact it was really true that this bacterium was found in the environment. So the work began in 1975, um, where we did field work, uh, next slide, in the, um, in the country. It was pretty clear that um, these uh, ponds or um, areas where the villagers' um, huts, their homes are surrounding the ponds, they're, they're dug out and the water accumulates and serves as a drinking water source, a latrine uh, in a far corner, but also a place to wash vegetables and uh, utensil, utensils, as well as daily baths. So, so it's, it's understandable that the contamination in the water system can occur person to person. We have the next slide. So we confirmed that what we had determined from early studies in the Chesapeake Bay uh, were the same in Bangladesh. In fact, uh, the microorganism is present but it's person-to-person -person transmission that occurs, uh, next slide, uh, that um, uh, causes the transmission, but we must remember that the organism does derive from the natural environment. It's autochthonous, meaning that it is naturally occurring in the estuarine river system. And what's fascinating is that it has an absolute requirement for the monovalent Ion. It can be spared a bit by lithium, but it's a sodium requirement. This was demonstrated work that uh, students and postdocs showed uh, to be absolutely the case uh, by using very, very um, purified um, reagents and um, highly pure water. And we were able to show that indeed that it does have this sodium requirement. It can be spared by divalence, which is very interesting because in seawater, brackish water, magnesium is the dominant cation divalent, but in fresh water, it's calcium. So that's why we can find vibrio cholerae in inland lakes and streams where there is a high calcium component that spares for the sodium requirement. Very interesting interaction because the, the um, cation requirement actually maintains integrity of the um, cells. In fact, it's fascinating to note that um, uh, very early days, um, uh, back in the days of Koch, uh, he developed what he called the string test, where you put um, suspended cells that you centrifuged and collected into distilled water. And then you got this gummy stringy stuff that when you put an inoculated loop in, you would pull it up and there'd be this uh, gummy material, which we now know is frankly the DNA. It was a, a very early DNA um, uh, method of, of, of obtaining the DNA from the cells, unknown of course, back in uh, 1870. But in any case, it demonstrates the salt requirement of the bacteria. Next slide. Now, the work that we were doing showed that the bacterium is definitely influenced by temperature, by um, um, the plankton. Uh, and this was fascinating because about, nine, about um, 1975 or 80, the Landsat satellite went up. And this carried sensors measuring chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, and sea surface height. And it occurred to me that um, we might be able to monitor um, the cholera uh, epidemics by uh, measuring chlorophyll and using that as a as a, um, an indicator, that is knowing that there is this relationship of zooplankton and phytoplankton that in the warm summer, uh, early, early spring months that is, the sunlight would warm the ocean surface, the, the chlorophyll bearing organisms would become abundant, and then the, the non-chlorophyll bearing organisms, the zooplankton, would feed on the the uh, chlorophyll phytoplankton. And so by a, an eight week or so delay, we could then calculate 
about eight weeks after the maximum bloom of chlorophyll detected by satellite, we would then begin to detect cases of cholera. We tested that, next slide, and it was in fact quite the case. By correcting that eight week delay, we were able to show an uncanny relationship. We published this 20 years ago, and it simply shows cholera cases in the Bay of Bengal, in Mathbaria, Bakuganj, in Dhaka, along the, the Bay of Bengal coast. And, and the, in this case, I'm showing the sea surface temperature in this remarkable relationship, really, of counting cholera cases and these satellite measured, sensor measured uh, parameters of chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, sea surface height. Height playing a role because of the tidal effects bringing the plankton into the river system. And the next slide. So we improved the models over the years, over the last 20 years, and now they're highly sophisticated. An intermediate model was developed by um, a, a postdoc, uh, Guillaume um, um, uh, Montaigne, who, who uh, came from um, Montpellier, France, to work in the lab and then has done some excellent work in Senegal and uh, um, uh, other countries in Africa working with the French government. What we were able to show is that in Calcutta, for example, for every milligram, milligram per cubic meter increase in chlorophyll measured by satellite, there'd be a 33% increase in the number of cholera cases. Similarly, in Mod Lab in Bangladesh, a, millimeter, um, a milligram per cubic uh, a meter in chlorophyll would give us a 31 or 32 percent increase in the number of cases. So this direct relationship between the measurements we were making by satellite sensing and the actual uh, cholera occurring in Bangladesh. Now, next slide. And so we've improved the model to the present uh, time where we now, because what we have done is go back, I don't have time to show all the all the data, but we went back to the recorded results um, by the British colonials from 1823 to about 1875 and to 1900. They were meticulous. They recorded cholera cases, deaths from cholera, deaths from malaria. Uh, they, re they recorded uh, temperature and uh, uh, air temperatures and rainfall. So we were able to build on the models that we had from the recent work we were able to establish from the very early work. And now we have a powerful model showing that with warm temperatures four weeks earlier, followed four weeks later by heavy rainfall, and in an area with poor sanitation or like Haiti with um, an earthquake and what poor sanitation existed is made even worse, you have a high cholera risk. So we can use satellite sensing to actually predict outbreaks of cholera. Next slide, please. And so we started in um, 1996 with the uh, Vibrio hypothesis and using Landsat. And then um, uh, with a team at NASA, we published in, uh, in 2001 PNAS study on the chlorophyll sea surface temperature using, again, improved uh, satellite sensing. And now, currently, we're using some really powerful uh, model, uh, uh, satellite sensors that um, are really, really sensitive that allow us to actually monitor movement of populations of individuals. We can actually determine when there is, a, for example, in Yemen, when there is fighting uh, because of the civil war, we can see the migration of population and then the accumulation in areas of the country and with all of this information, it allows us then to have very sophisticated um, prediction of cholera. May I have the next slide, please? And so um, what we've been able to do in this case, uh, this is a hurricane, Matthew, that um, uh, struck um, uh, Haiti. Uh, it struck uh, the east coast of the United States. Um, and we were able then to use a, um, a post um, hurricane prediction. Next slide. What we were able to do is calculate from our model 
uh, the prediction shown in the left in the orange and the dark red. But note where we have the dark red with the strongest severity of the prediction of cholera, that on the right is actually where cholera occurred. So this model uh, in using, uh, in 2015, using uh, our prediction, we were able to uh, be able to alert uh, if we use a prospective model. And that's what we did in Yemen. The next slide, please. We first um, estimated in 2017 with our model using retrospective data uh, of cholera and uh, the weather patterns and developing the cholera risk model. And the reported cases uh, fit exactly as we had predicted. We had a quick publication. Uh, this appeared uh, in the late um, 2017 in uh, one of the NASA publications, the AGU publications. And it was picked up by Scientific American, a little paragraph about using satellites to predict cholera. And a colleague in England um, read this um, Scientific American article and said, hmm, he worked for the uh, British aid agency and was working in Yemen. So he called us up and said, say, could we work together, which we did, starting in 2018, where uh, with the British aid agency, UNICEF, and the British Meteorological Agency, and NASA, of course, providing the satellite um, uh, uh, model um, uh, sensing, we put all this together. May I have the next slide, please? And what we were able to do is um, predict very accurately uh, not only what we had done in 2017, but again in 2018, and, and we're currently working in 2019 uh, uh, data, and we've also uh, currently are providing on a monthly basis because we're able to predict uh, four weeks ahead of time, and we're just about able to predict eight weeks ahead of time. So knowing where the highest risk is and the highest severity of the potential outbreak, the D British aid agency and UNICEF provide physicians medical supplies where we predict high risk, and we've been able to reduce cholera significantly. And we work regularly. Every month, we provide now a uh, risk map for Yemen, for DFID, and UNICEF. May I have the next slide, please? Let me turn now to, to the molecular, because it all ties together. What we had developed, next slide, is a technique uh, whereby we can extract DNA um, shotgun. Uh, community DNA is then fed to um, sequencing, uh, any sequencer, it doesn't matter, uh, Illumina uh, um, or any of the others. Uh, and we are able to match up with our database, which we've built, a very, very intensive 160 thousand curated genomes of bacteria, viruses, um, and also the genes. Uh, we're able to identify the microorganisms, but also uh, characterize uh, the, gen the genes that are present uh, and be able to describe the or organism as well as identify them. And that then provides us a very powerful identification tool. So we're now using this for um, uh, water samples, um, uh, clinical samples, et cetera. May I have the next slide, please? Let me, um, uh, we're able to identify down to strain. This is really important. For the microbiologists in the audience, uh, you don't need to be told why this is important. Um, may I have the next slide? For, uh, for the non-microbiologists, um, a strain is critical because, for example, uh, if you uh, have lactobacillus, one strain is used for making cheese, another for making wine, Chardonnay, and a third for making yogurt. In the case of pathogens, um, E. coli, uh, har where we harbor E. coli in our gut, it provides vitamin, it protects against pathogens like uh, uh, some of the, in the uh, uh, enteric um, um, uh, anaerobes, but it also strain 015787 uh, is enterohemorrhagic and 
causes disease. So it is really critical to identify strains. Now we've been working with the um, uh, Orange County Water District because they, uh, because of the drought in California, were, were needing to use sewage water uh, for purification for drinking water because of the drought. So they had arranged a system where the sludge from the sewage plant went out to sea in the Orange County area around Los Angeles and the water would come in the secondary effluent. It would go through additional heavy screening and then microfiltration, millipore filtration, reverse osmosis, irradiation, chlorination, etc. So we, we examined the input water and at each stage of purification, I have the next slide. And we were able to show that indeed the input water, the gray water coming in, carries all kinds of microorganisms. But by the time it goes through reverse osmosis, it's mostly just water bacteria, um, common um, non-pathogenic forms. I have the next slide. And we were all also able to show that um, in the case of viruses, uh, pepper uh, model virus, adenoviruses, human virus, are in the gray water, but by the time we get through the reverse osmosis biofilm uh, treated, the only uh, viruses are the, the bacteriophages and a few uh, DNA uh, phage, phages. Mostly um, the only virus of significance is the pepper virus, but that's not pathogenic for humans. Uh, but, the, but it's interesting because that water, uh, if used for agriculture, might not be recommended uh, for uh, pepper growers um, as it would introduce the pepper virus. Anyway, this shows us that the water is safe for human uh, consumption. We have the next slide. Um, one of the big questions um, is um, whether or not antibiotic resistance genes would be trans Preferred, uh, to the normal water bacteria and that what you'd end up is um, non-pathogens but a lot of antibiotic resistance. Well, in our studies we found that in the Q1, the input water, loads of antibiotic resistance genes, still a lot by, by the time it goes through micropore uh, filtration, but by the time it goes through reverse osmosis, very few and then as it goes through the additional purification, almost no antibiotic resistance, uh, at least transmitted to any of the water microorganisms. So um, the only antibiotic resistance was that present in the uh, normal um, iron bacteria or other water bacteria that we would find in any drinking water, treated drinking water. Uh, that we would test. We have the next slide. So let me turn now to COVID. Um, we have been able to uh, use our, our molecular techniques and our satellite um, sensitivity for being able to measure uh, environmental parameters and be able to predict um, cholera outbreaks. In the case of COVID-19, the SARS COVID-2, um, the, the uh, derivative or re relative of SARS, um, the COVID virus, uh, it's, it's a pretty nasty uh, bacterium and it's amazing how much we have learned in the six months uh, since the outbreak, the pandemic occurred. Uh, the, the virus uh, affects the lungs, but also the liver, kidneys, intestines, uh, it affects the brain, uh, um, taste and, and so forth. We have the next slide. But what we've, been, what we've been able to determine is by using our molecular approach, we can identify uh, using this uh, extraction of the uh, nucleic acids, we can identify the SARS-CoV-2, um, but also variants of it. So this means that we can, in clinical samples, as well as sewage samples, we can identify the presence of the virus uh, and the numbers, uh, or at least the trend in the numbers of the virus, um, and we can determine the variants of the virus as well. We have the next slide. So this allows us 
uh, this is taken from the literature, showing that um, the stool of uh, COVID-19 um, victims um, carries the virus shed in fairly large quantity, and next slide, for a fairly long period of time. Uh, this looks like a busy slide, but it really is simple. Uh, horizontally are the numbers of, of um, patients, uh, 41 patients, and, and you can see horizontally, red is um, the um, throat swab is positive, and the uh, yellow shows how long the fecal sample uh, remains positive even when the throat swab goes negative. So the fecal sample provides a very useful analysis, um, certainly for two reasons, being able to determine when is the um, various techniques of masking and hand washing and so forth working so that the cases go down and how long will the virus then continue to be shed, but also as a preemptive strike, because if you measure the virus, it turns out that the virus is shed in the sewage before, several days before, it actually is manifested uh, as a disease, either by the cough and uh, the various other symptoms associated with COVID. So this becomes a good predictor, just as we had been able to do, at least with respect to measuring stool samples, as we've been able to do with um, uh, cholera. But also to the point, we have the next slide, it turns out that there, there are environmental factors as well. We're now currently doing studies for the state of Maryland uh, in, um, in five locations, four in Maryland, uh, uh, and we're now regularly sampling a couple of times a week uh, sewage samples and being able to provide trend analysis. But more interesting, we have the next slide. We've been able to show um, the trend analysis, in this case is Frederick, Maryland, um, from June until uh, late July, uh, and, and it continues to trend downward in, in August. So this is a, a community measure. May I have the next slide? Um, and um, I guess I don't have the slides, but one of the very interesting things we're currently in the vault involved in doing is we found that the dew point and air temperature can be correlated in a climate prediction of locations where the outbreaks can occur. And we've been able to show in Michigan and uh, now in some other states that weather patterns allow us to predict when uh, and where outbreaks of COVID-19 will occur. Now, let me just show you some last data, which are, are fascinating. Uh, we've looked at the microbiomes of drinking water. Next slide. We've looked at um, bottled water, uh, spring water, artesian well water. We uh, sampled um, some drinking water fountains um, in Maryland. Um, um, site uh, will remain undesignated, but local. And so um, we, we looked at uh, these, these samples, next slide, and we were able to show that there's a distinct microbiome uh, principal component analysis. And you see the green dots are non-mineral bottled water. Uh, the blue shows sparkling mineral water. And um, the uh, red star in the triangle show municipal tap water and drinking fountain water. So there's characteristic microbiomes um, <clears throat> for these different kinds of water. Now the next slide. <clears throat> so fascinating results. The predominant bacterial species are the Atidobacter, Proteobacter. Uh, mineral water, we have uh, methyl methylolibium. And then uh, the only um, archaea were picked up in sparkling natural mineral water. No fecal indicators, so good, good treatment. And bacteriophages were present. And it was interesting because they served as a confirmation 
of the bacteria that we actually picked up. Um, and so um, this gives us a general background for understanding drinking water and the potential as a source of um, microorganisms. Yeah, the next slide, please. Let me close by, I can't resist showing uh, the sustainable method <laughs> that we developed for Bangladesh because we had been doing this extensive work funded by NIH, billions of dollars over 15 years, um, and using uh, elegant uh, DNA extraction techniques. But what could we do to help the villagers who still uh, depend on the pond water? We were able to do a study funded by the Nursing Institute of NIH. I was not sophisticated enough for the NIAID. They lateraled it over to the Nursing Institute, which I'm very grateful to the Nursing Institute. So we, for a three-year study, we um, trained women to be extension agents and to um, show village women how to filter water using simple sari cloth. We had worked out the sari cloth method and the materials in laboratory studies, and we were able to, with good confidence, have them use their own used uh, sari cloth as a filter. May I have the next slide? And um, we were able, it was very important for them to have a large piece of sari cloth that they would fold each time to use as a filter and then rinse well and air dry because sunlight is a disinfecting factor. So you can disinfect between using the uh, sari cloth each day in the morning to collect water for your, um, your family in your house. Yeah, the next slide. It didn't take a whole lot to convince them that the water was safe. The water on the right is clear and about as clear as you would see in tap water uh, in the US. And on the left, um, you see that it's very turbid and you can see things swimming. And we were able to make sure they understood those swimming things in the water were not good for their children. So this uh, filtration technique, next slide, was adopted and it was much preferred even to the nylon uh, material that was used uh, in Africa um, where it had been shown that the parasite um, for um, a, a specific disease could be removed by the nylon filter. Well, the nylon filter was very, very expensive and the sari cloth was almost nothing. It was every household had used sari cloth that they used for dust, ra dust rags anyway. And using it folded eight, six or eight times gave them a good filter for the water. May I have the next slide? Um, well, let me go back just a minute uh, for that the previous slide. Um, what we were able to show is that, um, next slide, that the rate of cholera was reduced about uh, almost 50% uh, by just sari cloth filtration. And what was very nice is that we went back five years later and we found that 75% of the women were still filtering water. And it was difficult to determine the effectiveness because the, the control villages where we had not instructed uh, in the use of filter, but had instructed every other process. In other words, use kalashes, clean them out every time you use them. But we had not instructed them to use sari cloth. They had learned about sari cloth and they were then using, all of the villagers were using the sari cloth filtration. And so the rate was very, very low in all the villages, but difficult to determine precisely uh, because everybody was filtering, filtering, including the control villagers. Now the next slide. So um, it takes a, a whole lot of people, my village I'll call it, to do this kind of work. Uh, wonderful colleagues at the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research in Bangladesh, the National Institute for Cholera and Enteric Diseases in Calcutta, India, and wonderful students, postdocs, visiting scientists at the, at the University of Maryland. Next slide. Um, lots of collaborators uh, of work that I um, haven't had time to talk about, but um, collaborators from other countries around the world and other parts of the United States. And next slide, please. Um, safe water remains a global challenge. 
uh, is, I think, after energy um, and after we've been able to um, provide sufficient uh, solar and wind and and uh, and uh, water powered age, uh, energy, we will have to turn to the issues of safe water and available water, even though we are the blue planet, only about 20% uh, of the water is really potable. Um, and next slide. Um, thank you very much for, for being able to talk with you and I'll be delighted to answer questions and to discuss this work and um, any other work that uh, you'd like. So thank you. So Rachel. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. Um, just so everyone knows, um, this talk will be posted on the IGB went website along with the seminar announcement. Um, thanks, that was, that was, was truly great. So we have some questions coming in, but so everybody knows you can post your questions to, um, to me directly on the chat. I know you've been reminded about that a couple times. Um, I will ask them, I guess, in the order that they came in. Um, so from um, Afran Ahmad, Rita, thanks for your wonderful work which agent and when possibly and where from will be the next epidemic to occur? That's ah. an easy one to start out with, so. Yes, um, we are working now to determine the fall second wave. And um, the preliminary data suggests there will be one. And I'm just now writing up the paper um, for publication. I just went through the first um, edit cycle and um, we're hoping to submit it um, within the next week or two. So you'll have more details on that um, uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but right now, um, we have been able to confirm with our, our prediction map the um, the states that are severely hit uh, in the South and um, in the Midwest. So, so far we're, we're pretty much on target and uh, that's retrospective and it's the prospective that the question addresses. And right now we're still working on that. So I'm not quite ready to say, except that it's looking pretty powerful for a wall, uh, a fall second wave. Darn it. Okay. If anybody wants to ask about the book, they can do that too. I'm happy to talk about anything. Okay. <laughs> um, here's one from Katie B. Um, um, she's curious about the timing of cholera. How quickly does the satellite mapping analysis and policy on the ground have to happen in order to make a difference? Okay, what we're doing now is that every month we provide a, a map and a risk, a risk map and, and all the data. This goes out uh, electronically to UNICEF and to DFID. Um, they use that um, as a four week warning system. And so that's where they, they look to be um, locating their supplies and physicians at the points of highest risk. And it's been working out really well. Okay. Um, here's one from John Schneider. Um, can you talk a little more about predicting COVID outbreaks from temperature or dew point? What is the relationship and how tight is the correlation? What is the size of the effect? That's really a great question and right smack to the point. Uh, it turns out the dew point and the, and the temp air temperature uh, a critical and, and that there's a range um, of temperature and within which the dew point uh, must fall for the prediction to be um, reasonably accurate. And so right now that's where we're in the paper that is about to be submitted. So email me in about um, two weeks and I'll give you the, a, a preprint. Kind of 
a similar question. Um, do you find any temperature thresholds, minimum or maximum, that reduce cholera transmission? That one's from um, John Ullman. Uh, that, that's an interesting question because in the winter months, um, that's when the microorganism goes, goes into the non-culturable stage. And um, it's, it, it, it remains pathogenic, but it, it's a more of a time delay. Uh, and again, you have to ingest a, a lot of the cells and a lot of them have to uh, come out of uh, the non-culturable state. So, so in the winter months, um, for example, in the Chesapeake Bay, prior to, to 1910, when chlorination of the water wasn't done, drinking water, it was very clear that from a, sort of late July, beginning of August until mid-September or mid beginning of October was the cholera season. And in fact, this was recorded interestingly because um, the uh, CNO Canal, the history of it, the history book shows that the canal workers would run away. They would, they would go, go anywhere. They wouldn't stay around between August and September because they knew that if they did, <laughs> they would get sick and they'd probably die. So the canal construction just ceased between July and October. So that was a pretty, and in fact, in, in Mon at the Monocacy Aqueduct, there is a, a concrete um, slab that states uh, dedicated to the canal workers who died building the canal, CNO Canal. So that's kind of historical evidence of during the year when it was no, most likely that you would get cholera. And it's due to that proliferation of the abundant phytoplankton and zooplankton in the water, uh, the nutrients, all of this comes together and bingo, you have an outbreak. Great. Um, I have a question. I know that the um, cholera, cholera toxin is, I think, on a filamentous stage. Um, and I was wondering if the toxin um, has any advantage like in nature that you know of? Does it impact the way the um, infected cell might target other cells, other um, vibrio cells that don't have or anything like that? Sure, I, that's a good question. I think that really refers to the capacity of the organism to form biofilms. Mm -hmm. And when it encapsulates itself, it becomes quite resistant uh, to pH and, and a variety of other factors. And, and so that, again, um, in the early days, that was one way of actually collecting cholera samples, was use uh, the Moore swab, which was just a gauze pad that you hung on a string and hung over the line with a, with a weight on the end of it and left it a period of time. And, and the bacteria would form uh, colonies uh, and form a film on the swab, and that was a way to, to isolate it from the environment. But in fact, um, uh, during the, the uh, cholera season, so to speak, it really, the, the organism is really quite readily culturable directly. But during the winter months, it's not. In fact, that's when we had to use um, the um, uh, fluorescent uh, ligated monoclonal antibody to demonstrate its presence because People said we were crazy, that it, it didn't exist, it died in the winter. Well, we collected samples and we stained them and there they were, uh, nice little, kind of rounded up. They weren't as typically rod shaped, but still measurably vibrio. And, and then with the techniques of DNA um, extraction and sequencing, uh, we were able to prove beyond a measure of doubt that those were cholera bacteria and they were present in a dormant stage. Okay. Um, from Gemma, Dr. Caldwell, thank you for your wonderful talk. Could you expand a little more on cholera risks and other infectious diseases with increased extreme weather events like hurricanes? Is the risk through drinking water, surface water, or other sources? Excellent question. Um, 
we are finding that the range of um, infections, not just cholera, but malaria and dengue, et cetera, um, is expanding with climate change. And in fact, we actually did a study published in PNAS uh, three or four years ago, um, where we worked together with a wonderful team in Italy, Carla, uh, Carla Pruzzo and her team, um, and um, the um, Max Planck team in Germany uh, on the DNA work, and the Marine Lab in Southampton, where the Marine Lab had collected plankton samples 40 years ago. They had started this um, citizen science program where they had um, yachtsmen and ferry boat captains and, and uh, cruising boat captains um, collect zooplankton and they uh, stored them. So we went back um, to the 40 year old samples, 39, 38, 37, and we were able to show that by extracting the DNA and probing with Vibrio vulnificus, Vibri Vibrio perihemolyticus, and Vibrio cholerae probes, we could show an increase with the warming temperature of the surface, sea surface in the North Atlantic. And we were able to correlate that with increasing cases recorded in, in uh, France and England uh, and Spain of uh, Vibrio vulnificus infections, Vibrio perihemolyticus infections, not so much Vibrio cholerae because it didn't become that abundant, but occasional cases. And so that was the first, I think, demonstration, direct demonstration of climate change and infectious disease effect on humans. And that was published in PNAS. Okay. Um, Ipshita Upagadhe wants to um, express thanks um, they're a second year student um, working on develop a vaccine for cholera and is really grateful for um, your work, excited about your seminar, and gives you lots of thanks for linking COVID-19 to cholera, which is interesting and so logical. Um, and then Rebecca Batstone, um, who's our uh, IGO fellow, asks, um, are there any analogous methods to convince people that wearing masks is effective to reduce COVID transmission? I think the sari cloths just show it. Good I know. <laughs> if anything, I mean, just filtering water and removing all the particulates, uh, we've removed the bacteria. Come on, guys. If you have a nice mask on, uh, you don't breathe out any, if you are carrying the virus, you don't breathe out the, um, the micro um, uh, droplets. Um, nor do you inhale them. So what better logical sense. But is there any data like a graph? Um, I, there are some wonderful scientists. Um, there's a, oh gosh, I'm bad on names. North Carolina um, and in Virginia, there are a couple of women scientists doing great work on, on masks and um, they would have data. And then my colleague, Don Milton at the University of Maryland has been working on aerosols and has, I think, unequivocally demonstrated that uh, aerosol dissemination is important. In fact, um, the University of Maryland, they're combining uh, dormitory aerosol trapping um, of the virus um, as symptomatology measurement and also specific to the dorm sewage coming out measuring uh, the virus and being able to kind of do this multi-dimensional uh, measurement of the immediate uh, occurrence of a case, being able to immediately test that person and his or her contacts and without having to test the whole campus to be able, or even the whole dorm, it might be just one or two rooms to be able to go in and very quickly um, um, uh, quarantine the case. So yeah, and this is all happening so fast. It's amazing. I guess that's assuming that the data is what convinces people to wear masks, which is not necessarily a good assumption at this point. There has yeah. to be something. Yeah. But, you have to believe um, in science. Mm -hmm. um, 
you didn't have your book, um, a picture of your book on the on your slides. Um, okay. So I, I was gonna put it up, but I, I figured you would. <laughs> um, Is this the kickoff to your book tour? Um, this this would have been part of the book tour. <laughs> um, I love one zone. And the ch the chapter I, I, the chapters I like best of the chapter on cholera, and the chapter on um, anthrax. People don't know, but I chaired as NSF director. I chaired a classified committee of um, about fifteen or sixteen agency representatives. We worked for five years at advising the CIA and the FBI to track down uh, the source of the anthrax and we feel pretty comfortable because we use molecular sequencing. And this was, remember guys, this was, um, oh gosh, 19 years ago when we had maybe the sequence of a couple of bacteria, little ones, and half the sequence of uh, anthrax. So it was, um, it was a marathon. It was a few SNPs, right? Yeah, it yeah. was a marathon being able to show the presence of um, a couple of mutants that were very, very um, distinct. Mm -hmm. But it was amazing. Well, it's one o'clock and so we're really grateful for your time and for, um, and for ending on time. So many of these things go over, but um, we got all the questions in. Um, and then I know you have time later to talk to postdocs and students as well. Um, thank you so much for coming. It was so great to virtually meet you and uh, talk to you um, during the faculty time and to have you visit our campus. We know you know what it's like, but to have you talk with us as a group. So um, yeah, perhaps I'll have a visit later on. In the yeah. Summer. Okay, great. We'll take you up on that. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank Keep you. Bye-bye.